Good evening. Welcome to Pharmavation Friday, where we're going to talk about pharmacy innovation as we kick off National Pharmacist Month. I'm here, your host, Kimmer Booth. Developing your innovation skill and making it a habit is really critical to our successes. Are you an innovator? Or maybe you're frustrated by others who you think should be thinking innovatively, but they really think or act that way? Well, a well-known innovator of our times, of course, is Steve Jobs, but innovation is not just restricted to CEOs. It's important at work and useful in our daily lives as we grow and adapt to change. So individuals and managers need to break from our traditional ways of thinking and create and nurture an environment of innovation. So today during Pharmavation Friday, we will explore pharmacy innovation. Welcome to Connector Dots. These are brief, candid insights on healthcare, pharmacy, and life for connectors and pharmavators. I'm your host, Kimber Booth, and I'm a strategic pharmacy coach and consultant. I help pharmacists to advocate for roles and resources to advance pharmacy practice and to have engaging, joyful careers. Today, we're going to be covering what is innovation, and I want to share some specific examples of some pharmacy innovations. This is a brief session, so we won't be able to get into all the details, but just wanted to share some highlights to get your juices flowing. So there's lots of different definitions of innovation, but one quote from Steve Jobs is that innovation is the ability to see change as an opportunity and not a threat. By a dictionary definition, it really is a new idea, method, or device. It comes from the Latin word innovare, which means to make something new. And, you know, it can be described as bringing some kind of new idea, problem solving idea into use. It's often viewed as the application of better solutions to problems that we have, unarticulated needs, or some type of a market need. When I pull all this together from the different definitions, I say that it's executing an idea which addresses a specific challenge and achieves value for both the company and the customer. When we think about innovation then, there's different kind of levels or types of innovation. So I break it down into there's different outcomes of innovation, a degree of innovation, and then the degree of change that is required. So when it comes to the outcome, you know, innovation can take many forms. We often think of it as like products, um, and you getting a new product, the iPad, you know, the iPhone, those are innovative, you know, products. Uh, but in, you know, pharmacy, we definitely do see innovative products. We see new technology, new devices that we use in pharmacy. But it also is about new services. Uh, and so I'll definitely talk to you about some innovative pharmacy services that we do both in our operations and pharmacy practice, clinical services, and patient care. And it could just be a new process. You know, innovation can be creating a new workflow of how we do something, even if you don't get um, you know, changes in the actual technology. When it comes to that degree of novelty, you often hear about um, you know, radical, revolutionary um, innovation, which is really, truly you know, unexpected um, innovation. But you know, evolutionary um, innovation is more um, something that is expected and it's maybe like a, an improvement on a product that's already there. Now, the degree of change then gets into that where you hear that term disruptive innovation. That's very common. And I know there's a great conference being held today in California for disruptive healthcare innovation um, with some of my fellow entrepreneurial um, innovation and technology colleagues. So when you get to the degree of change, it's going to be either a sustaining or disruptive. So again, sustaining means it's something that's, again, not going to ma make major changes to um, existing markets, dis existing patterns of purchasing, et cetera. But disruption is definitely where you create a new market. And so things like the electronic health record and healthcare was definitely uh, a disruptive innovation for sure. So why do we care about innovation? It's... Um, it seems like this lofty idea, it's a term I think that's been thrown out a lot, but I, in my research, I've definitely found innovation to be uh, really, again, I think as I mentioned before, critical 
uh, that we include it. And being able to think innovatively uh, will help us um, daily and within our annual strategic planning. I've talked before about entrepreneurship. And so there's definitely a role of entrepreneurship and the, how it ties to innovation. Basically, what the research shows is that virtually all economic growth that has occurred since the 18th century has really been attributable to innovation. They find that innovative companies are adaptable, competitive, have higher margins, and that companies that don't invest in innovation are putting their futures at risk. So we want to ensure that our organizations are supporting that. And I'll definitely encourage you to go to um, one of my blog posts that I have uh, where I did talk about innovation uh, tips. And there's also a download for do's and don'ts and that's at camberbooth.com slash blog slash 009. So you can check that out uh, as well. We won't get into all those details today. I like to think about innovation as not just about that disruptive innovation, but it really can be also about adopting new ideas faster. And I find that in healthcare, that's one of our, our biggest challenges is it's almost like we're not, we're not short on new innovative ideas. We're short on adopting them and putting them into practice. And that's where justifying and putting, um, you know, getting the resources approved, whether it's, you know, a new process, you know, new technology, new people to do something, um, that is a challenge. So the term that often gets used is the diffusion of ideas is often slow. And so in healthcare, this is often called the evidence practice gap. <coughs> Excuse me. So the evidence practice back Gap definitely talks about data. You know, when we have clinical trials, new information that comes out, it takes a long time before some of that can get put into practice. And I want you to guess how long it takes new data to make it to full, full practice. And I want you to guess. I know my, not many of you join this immediately live. Most of you send me messages that you're catching it on a replay, but um, it can actually take a decade is what research is showing. So you know, we can't, that, that's like, you know, really slow pace if you're thinking about change. We don't have that much time. Um, when it does come to the electronic health record, which I did mention, definitely the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act or ERA did include the incentive for adoption of the EHR. And that definitely helped to move that forward faster, but it still has taken a long time. So let's jump now into some examples of pharmacy innovation. Now that we've kind of covered, you know, what is innovation. Uh, and I think of pharmacy innovation, I kind of break it down between services or technology. So from a service perspective, um, there's definitely different examples out there in terms of related to our how we practice, what kind of things we do for, for our patients. And the technology can be used in a variety of settings. So I'm going to give you some of those examples. Now, definitely pharmacy has gotten into the business of innovation, where we have different examples of organizations that are putting forth specific efforts around innovation. Uh, there is the University of Maryland Center for Innovative Pharmacy Solutions. There's actually a journal that's Innovations in Pharmacy. There's the Institute for Innovative Pharmacy Practice. Cedarville University has a Center for Pharmacy Innovation. Uh, VCU, my alma mater, has the Center for Pharmacy Practice Innovation. APHA has the Foundation for Practice Innovation, and then ASHP recently launched this past year the Innovation Center. So we're definitely seeing uh, efforts put around this, and I'm definitely you know passionate about this topic um, because I do want to help speed up that change diffusion to adopt these new things and you know identify new things. Um, I don't have time to talk about here, but definitely, you know, being part of teams, multidisciplinary teams who are working to find innovation solutions can be um, enjoyable. So the ASHP Innovation Center, I'll just share with you some of the areas that they are working on. Uh, I think some of their efforts have been a little bit delayed with COVID, but they are looking at major areas such as digital transformation, AI, artificial intelligence, 
other innovations in, in pharmacy practice or, you know, the services that we provide, uh, having advanced data analytics and use of big data, um, optimizing technologies, things like auto verification, robotics, virtual reality, and even digital therapeutics, where we are using that to help treat our patients. And then finally, genomics and personalized medicine. So obviously, those are all big innovations and our organizations may be investing in some, some aspect of that. On the acute care side for service innovation, there's still huge opportunities, whether you're talking about how we're providing the operational aspects of our workflow and how we support our patients, whether it's individualized doses, you know, getting the meds to the patient's bedside with the nurse and making that streamlined diversion management among others. On the clinical side of our acute care services, I think of this as both, you can have individual initiatives and then you can have whole practice model changes. And well, you know, I like to go big and I like to have big practice model changes. Sometimes that requires more resources. So sometimes you do have to start smaller, maybe through pilots, residents and student projects can help you do this. So where can you have pilots where you're expanding clinical services? You know, I go back to medication histories and medication reconciliation all the time because again, that's an area where I feel like we have tons of data, but yet we are not putting pharmacy resources for medication reconciliation across our nation. So those are some examples um, of what we can do. Uh, another quote I wanted to share with you is that, you know, we, um, Bill Gates says that we always overestimate the change that will occur in the next two years, but underestimate the change that will occur in the next 10. So don't lull, let yourself be lulled into inaction. This is where it's so easy to just think about what do we need to do this year, but this, this is where we need to be thinking bigger and bolder for what we have in the future and what we might need to tackle in the shorter term. On the ambulatory side, definitely seeing lots of innovation there, but again, we do see some organizations that have put innovative pharmacy practices in place, and we need to diffuse that to all locations. And again, I would love to see a full practice model change. Places like Geisinger Health and even the VA are trying to get to a model where they have one pharmacist for every three primary care doctors. And if we would get to that, that that pharmacist would be integrated, they could be managing all of the, you know, the highest risk patients in those populations versus what we do now, we have to maybe justify people to take care of certain individual diseases. Um, I would love to go big here, but I know that's not always realistic. So where can we help improve, do um, chronic um, obstructive pulmonary disease support, heart failure management, pharmacogenomics? There's individual initiatives that we could potentially justify, as well as you know other initiatives on a primary care perspective that we can help support their primary care and improvement, of course, of some of the value-based payments that is, of course, a source of return on investment for those services. So you can definitely do these smaller initiatives, specialty disease states, primary care disease states. I would love to get to a model where we could have just make the ratio, the right ratio, the pharmacists are part of the care team, and it's just a given. So that's my dream, and that's why I started my business. Now, on the technology side, if we transition from like the services we provide, technology, of course, can help us provide better services. But in general, when I think about technology, there's a lot of different technologies. And I've seen some crazy maps and some very intense presentations of all the technology innovations that we see in healthcare and even in pharmacy and medication specifically. I tend to group them into automation and analytics. So uh, a lot of the um, tools out there on the pharmacy practice side, operations, et cetera, definitely help us with some of the automation. How can we make things easier in the analytics? Is the data, the artificial intelligence, how can we use that information to make better decisions quicker and easier? That there's lots of terms around um, technology uh, analytics and artificial intelligence. So I just wanted to share a few of the definitions that I've come to know. So 
basically, you know, the uh, artificial intelligence in general is basically it's just any technology that enables computers to mimic human behavior. And that's mimicking intelligence, which is our ability to learn and solve problems. Machine learning comes in is when the computers are then using additional, additional statistical models and methods that enable them to improve. You know, they're learning basically. The machine is actually learning to make better decisions. And then deep learning or DL comes in, which is just another layer where neural networks are feasible. So lots of technology there, but we do need to start understanding that better. Now, I do find that when I talk to people about technology, they can have one or two reactions. They either want to run scared and leave and do something different because they are nervous and overwhelmed by the, the the risk that might be involved with this. And then there's other people who want to fully embrace it. I'm sure there's somewhere in the middle too. But basically what research has shown is that if we can improve our efficiency that can be gained through enabling these types of technologies that allows our pharmacists and our other team members to devote more personalized patient care time with detailed high touch patient care, we will not decrease the need for our staff, but we'll actually be able to improve outcomes because we'll have better access to technology. So I just wanna encourage you not to be scared by technology. So in technology, again, I like to think about this as, you know, kind of what do we need on our acute care settings? What do we need in our ambulatory settings? And even what do we need for patient care, um, you know, where we have like digital wearable technologies. So. The, it is actually shown that health systems are increasing their technology budgets in pharmacy and includes, you know, the big ones like automated dispensing cabinets, the physician order entry, barcoding, syringe pumps, compounding technology, radio frequency ID, barcoding, um, diversion management. There's a whole bunch of areas that health systems are investing in for their technology and taking an advantage of these innovations. But it's still pretty slow when you think about some of these, that these things have been around for a long time and it's really still continues to take a while for that diffusion to happen. In the outpatient setting on our retail and community pharmacies, we definitely are seeing investments in automation as well, you know, prior authorization technology, also barcode technology, you know, it's I think we've gotten so used to doing barcode technology in the acute care setting, it doesn't exist in all outpatient settings, both in the, the clinic areas as well as in the pharmacies. So lots of other examples as well. And of course, from the ambulatory clinic setting, one of the biggest technology advances is around telehealth, which it too was kind of inching along kind of slowly. And then of course the pandemic came and that was definitely cause for immediate adoption of telehealth. So lots of investments there, companies that were slowly inching along now have so many customers and this the number of visits that are being conducted by telehealth have exploded. I think it's exciting and I think it actually increases the opportunities for, for pharmacists because we can't be in every clinic, right? Just is not feasible based on the number of doctors and number of clinics out there, we will not be able to be in all of them, but how can we have access to the data, the information to be able to help be an integral part of that team? Now, the last technology area that I did wanna mention is for the patient. And a quote by Warner Slack was that it can be argued that the largest yet most neglected healthcare resource worldwide is the patient. <laughs> you got it. We, our patient is a valuable healthcare resource, right? They need to be engaged and they have lots of information. So the technology innovations that exist for our patients is definitely mobile health or M health as it's called, where patients can be using mobile devices to monitor and detect changes. There can be patient experience things that they can be involved with and even new innovations around virtual tech reality virtual um, rehab or behavioral changes can be supported that way. So these are just a few examples of pharmacy innovation, just to wet your whistle a bit. 
it personally makes me very excited. So I hope you're excited about the potential for innovation and I encourage you to engage in it and learn more. This is a longer session today, I think, than usual, but I really appreciate you being here uh, on this Pharmavation Friday. Uh, again, if you want to learn more about innovation, you can visit my blog, kimberbooth.com slash blog slash 009. I also want to let you know that my program, Pharmavation, is going to be available again in January to kick off the new year. Um, and in that program, of course, I named it <laughs> after pharmacy and innovation and how important I see that and how we can strategically advocate for resources. So I invite you to sign up for updates at kimberbooth.com slash formovation. So join me for future Connector Dots. Monday is Mindset Monday. Uh, I look forward to seeing you. Have a wonderful weekend. Be bold, be a connector, and advance healthcare and pharmacy practice. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.